I'm going to talk about something that I call extreme genealogy. I'm going to talk about an ancestor that is so distant in our past that most people never imagined that we would be able to think about such distant ancestors. And so to start, I want to show you a picture of what some of these ancestors might have looked like. So if we could just have the next slide. Uh, now the first thing you might say is, well, I don't really notice any personal resemblance between what I see in the mirror and when I see these like beach-like grains of, of sand. These particular grains were extracted from meteorites at uh, the University of uh, Washington in uh, St. Louis by astrogeologists. And, and they're tiny, they're only billionths of a meter in size. But for however small they are, these little grains of stardust are at the foundation, I think, of an, of an enormous scientific revolution. A revolution I call the stardust revolution. And it's about how these little grains of stardust are changing the understanding of life in a cosmic context. And that we as living beings here on Earth are not somehow different than the rest of the cosmos, but rather that life is an absolute reflection of the essence of cosmic processes. Now from time immemorial, people have had a sense of their deep connection with stars in the, in the sense of heat and light. So we know that essentially we eat stars at a certain level. And when we're eating plants, we're eating plants that have converted sunlight into food and that all life on Earth ultimately depends on the heat and light from stars. So we have that energetic sense of connection from stars. But in the Stardust Revolution, in the last 50 years of, uh, of science, we've realized we don't just have an energetic connection with stars. We have a fundamental physical connection with stars. We are physically connected to stars. And the, the, the key uh, discovery in that story happened 55 years ago. And it was a famous paper uh, called The Synthesis of Elements in Stars. And it was written by four, four scientists, a couple named uh, uh, Margaret and Jeff Burbage, two Bs, uh, an astrophysicist named Fred Hoyle, and a uh, nuclear physicist named William Fowler. And because of their initials, their paper, The Synthesis of Elements in Stars, is called B squared for the two Burbages, FH. B squared FH. For hundreds of years, philosophers, scientists, alchemists had thought, well, where do these elements come from? Are they eternal? Are they made? And really, the big question for the alchemists who were trying to make some money from this, could you change one into the other? Could you change lead into gold? Well, B squared FH answered that question. Because they explained in that paper, kind of standing on the shoulders of various generations of, of scientific giants, that all of the elements, the only two elements that were formed in the very beginning at the Big Bang were hydrogen and helium. Hydrogen and helium, the simplest atom, hydrogen, and the next simplest, helium. And all of the other elements, all of the things that we think of as stuff, were formed in stars. That literally it's the process of hydrogen and helium coming together in stars and through a process of nuclear cookery that was described in this paper, B squared FH, stars physically produce all of the other elements. In the process, they release light and heat and they make the, they make the elements. But the big question was, yes, stars make elements, Okay, we are stardust, but how? How do you go from a star to us? And the missing link in this story is stardust. Now in the 1960s, infrared technology, the ability to kind of see heat, if you imagine night goggles, had been developed. And for the first time, some pioneering astronomers thought, wow, I wonder what would happen if we looked at the cosmos with infrared telescopes. And what they saw when they looked in the infrared was literally a different universe. Because instead of just seeing stars, which are emitting light that we can see with our eyes, they saw vast amounts of stardust. 
they saw that the stars that they thought were just producing light and somehow forging elements were in fact spewing these elements out into space around them as dust. How do we know that these little bits of stardust are actually related to us and to stars? And for a genealogist, the gold standard would be to actually have some DNA, some ancestral DNA that we could compare with our DNA and say, yes, in fact, that this ancestor was from a star. And the amazing thing about these grains of stardust is that each one is the equivalent, has the equivalent of the stellar DNA built into it. And that's because each type of star produces, when we talk, I mentioned they produce these el the, the elements of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. At different points in their, in their lifetime, they produce these in very particular ways. So the dust that they're producing has the signature, has the, you know, the stellar fingerprint of the kind of star that made it. So that we look that now when these astrogeologists, these literally astronomers who can hold little bits of stardust in their hand, look at these grains, they can, they can look at the elements they contain and tell, okay, this is the kind of star that produced it. Periodically when I read your book, I had to stop and just kind of, you know, absorb this information because it, it it really does change the way you think about yourself, about nature, about our place in nature. When uh, you read through the book, you're, you're building towards what I see is, is some of the most exciting elements towards the end with exoplanets and, mm. you know, uh, looking for uh, something to compare our planet to. Mm -hmm. I mean, we obviously hope to find uh, another planet with life and the idea that they could actually get light that passes through an atmosphere coming towards us and to be able to analyze that atmosphere mm. or to tell the how it moves around the, their star and what the uh, you know if it's in the habitable Goldilocks zone just by looking at these points of light the idea to dissect light and get all of this information it, it, it's phenomenal it's absolutely mm. phenomenal to get so much information from I have a, a t-shirt, uh, I should have uh, I should have worn that t-shirt, that said, you know, when I was a kid there were nine planets, you know, there were nine planets in the universe. You know, now we know of about 2,000. Actually, the amazing thing, 20, I love 2012, you know, it's 2012 the end of the segue in here, but Michelle, I'll come back to your question. But 2012, you know, so the, the great cataclysmic year is actually, I think, a great awakening. This is the first year we now have more direct image pictures of planets around other stars than we have of planets in our own solar system. But the irony is that while we have the technology now, and really, uh, you know, in the astronomy community, this is the, this is the holy grail to now find another Earth-like planet around another star. There is no political will. And in large part because this is a revolution that has primarily taken place in the United States. And in the United States, the whole concept of terrestrial evolution is still a hot button topic. You don't hear that, you know, debated in the presidential elections. So no president yet has said, you know what, forget about going to the moon or Mars. This isn't, this isn't the great space race of our generation. The great space race of our generation is to find a sister Earth.